In unit three, lecture one, part four, we're going to be looking at the ability uh, to invade host cells and what that role that plays in bacterial colonization of the host. So once again, make sure you read through your fundamental statements or bullet points for this soft chalk lesson. Answer and learn your detailed learning objectives for the unit three exam. And we have three highlighted bacteria in this soft chalk lesson, Shigella, Salmonella, and Borrelia burgdorferi. So remember our current topic are virulence factors that promote bacterial colonization of the hosts, things bacteria do to better enable them to establish themselves in the body or cause infection. And we're gonna look at the third factor now, the ability to invade host cells. Not all bacteria can invade host cells. Most bacteria grow on host cells, but some bacteria are able to invade host cells. So some bacteria produce molecules sometimes called invasins that activate the host cytoskeletal machinery, enabling the bacteria to enter the host cell by phagocytosis. In other words, they trick the host cell into engulfing the bacteria and pulling it inside. Now there's two advantages to the ability of bacteria to invade host cells. If the bacterium is inside our cell, it basically gets free food. It provides the bacterium with a ready supply of nutrients. The bacterium doesn't have to compete with the microbiota and all the other host cells for the same food. The host cell is already bringing in the nutrients and the bacteria can use them. And secondly, by being inside our cell, that can protect the bacteria from complement proteins of the complement pathway, from antibody molecules we make, and other body defenses. So those are two real advantages of bacteria being able to aid uh, invade cells. Having a ready supply of nutrients because it's already in the host cell and the host cell is bringing in the food and protecting the bacteria from defense molecules. Now in addition, some bacteria can invade phagocytic cells. Up here we're talking about bacteria invading cells that aren't phagocytes sometimes, just things like epithelial cells. But some bacteria actually invade phagocytic cells and then neutralize their killing ability. And so the bacteria is able to live safely within the phagocyte. For example, salmonella often survives inside of phagocytes called macrophages. Once the salmonella is engulfed and placed in a phagosome, the salmonella uses a type three secretion system to inject molecules out of the phagosome into the cytoplasm of the macrophage. And these molecules, shown here as green circles, prevent the lysosome from fusing with the phagosome. And of course, if the lysosome can't fuse with the phagosome, the bacteria are not uh, killed and degraded. And so they can replicate inside the macrophage. And then some phagocytes, or some uh, bacteria, when they invade cells, kill phagocytic dendritic cells. Now, dendritic cells are cells we use to activate our T4 lymphocytes and our T8 lymphocytes. And these, of course, are cells required for adaptive immunity. So without dendritic cells, we can not activate our T4 lymphocytes that regulate immunity through cytokine production or T8 lymphocytes that become cytotoxic T lymphocytes. And so if the bacterium can kill the dendritic cell, it can activate these defense cells and that suppresses some of our immune responses. So invasions of a number of bacteria like Salmonella and Shigella, both of these infect the intestinal tract. Uh, salmonella typically causes non-bloody diarrhea. Shigella uh, ca often causes ulceration of the colon where you have blood and mucus in the school stool called dysentery. Uh, enteroinvasive strains of E. coli or EIEC. These bacteria often enter epithelial cells of the colon. And often they use a type three secretion system in the process as we'll be seeing as we go through here. So when these bacteria contact the epithelial cells of the colon, the type three secretion system delivers proteins into the epithelial cell that enable them to polymerize and then depolymerize actin filaments. 
and this allows pseudopods to form, which then engulf the bacterium and bring it into the cell and place it in a vacuole in our cell. So the invasions are tricking things like epithelial cells into acting like a phagocyte, and they wind up engulfing the bacteria, where again, they have a, a free supply of food and they can resist body defense molecules like antibodies and complement proteins. And the bacteria then replicate within the cell. And we see that in animations. We mentioned this under invasins in unit one, where uh, once a bacterium adheres to a cell through a variety of means, then a type three secretion system will inject effector molecules into the cytoplasm of the cell. And when they're called invasins, they typically cause polymerization of actin molecules, which pushes up against the membrane from the inside, producing pseudopodes that engulf the bacteria and place it in a vacuole. And so now the bacterium finds it itself inside the host cell where it can replicate. And we'll look at a number of examples where bacteria are invading host cells. Shigella does a couple of unique things when it causes dysentery. Again, dysentery is where it causes ulceration of cells from uh, cell death, and that leads uh, to blood and mucus in the stool. Now, one of the things we think Shigella can do is transit the mucous membranes of the colon by passing through special cells called M cells. M cells are fake acidic cells in the mucous membrane, and their purpose is to sample microbes from the intestinal lumen, from bacteria going through the intestines. And they're taken in by M cells and passed on to dendritic cells, which then carry them to lymphoid tissue to begin production of antibody molecules. But what happens is that uh, once the Shigella cr crosses the uh, M cell, that uh, can be passed on to dendritic cells, and their job again is to carry microorganisms to the nearest lymphoid tissues where they can activate um, T4 lymphocytes, which are needed as cytokine producers for antibody production, and also activate T8 lymphocytes needed for cell-mediated immunity. But uh, what they can do is with a type 3 secretion system, they can uh, trigger apoptosis of the phagocytic, of the dendritic cell. They kill the dendritic cell and commit suicide, and that releases the shigella on the underside of the mucous membranes, where they can adhere to host cells, use the type 3 secretion system to trick the epithelial cell into engulfing it from the underside. And then they're going to do another unique thing. Uh, which only a few bacteria can do, they're going to carry out what's called actin-based motility. What they can do is they begin to polymerize actin, chains of, uh, of actin proteins at one end of the cell. And as these elongate, they push the bacterium through the cell. They also produce an enzyme that breaks down the microtubules inside the cell, which would normally impede their ability to move in the cell. And in fact, this actin-based motility is strong enough that when the bacterium contacts uh, the, the membrane of that cell, it can actually push the bacterium into an adjacent cell and now can start replicating in adjacent cells. So as we saw, once they escape from the vacuole, as we see here, once it's engulfed by the underside of the cell, uh, produces a protease that cleaves the tubulin, and the microtubules prevent a ba barrier to bacterial movement within the infected cell. The protease breaks down that barrier, and now through, uh, they begin to polymerize actin filaments at one end of the bacterium. These produce comet-like tails that propel the shigella through the cytoplasm of the host cell. And again, when the shigella reaches the boundary of that cell, the actin filaments push the sigella across the membrane into the adjacent cell. So this enables bacteria to spread cell to cell with having, without having to encounter defense molecules like antibodies. And as the shigella grow and spread within the epithelial cells, those cells die, 
They promote a strong inflammatory response, uh, eventually leading to bleeding and the causing, causes of dysentery. So that's what we showed you up here in unit three, the whole process, where the shigella in the lumen or cavity of the intestine can be taken in by M cells, special phagocytes in the mucous membranes that transport it across the cell, pass it on to dendritic cells that are supposed to process the shigella and carry it to lymph nodes where it can activate T4 lymphocytes needed to produce the cytokines for good production of antibodies against the shigella. But the shigella is able to kill the uh, dendritic cell in which it now finds itself. And as the dendritic cell commits suicide or apoptosis, the shigella is released from the underside and it adheres and uses a type 3 secretion system to trick the epithelial cell in engulfing it and placing it in a vacuole. Once it escapes the vacuole, it starts polymerizing actin at one end, forming an actin tail and it breaks down the microtubules so the bacteria can be pushed around inside the epithelial cell. When it reaches the boundary, it can be pushed into adjacent cells and they too become infected. And eventually these cells die, <clears throat> leading to ulceration of the colon and bleeding and mucus in the stool. Now also the Shigella can induce the host cell to produce cytokines that attract uh, phagocytes and dendritic cells to the area. And again, when it enters the dendritic cell, uh, the dendritic cells can transport the shigella across the mucous membranes, where they can then deliver it to the nearest uh, lymphoid tissue in the colon and begin the process of antibody production against that shigella. But again, because they can kill the dendritic cell in which they now reside through apoptosis cell suicide, that releases the shigella on the underside. So they have a couple ways that Shigella can cross the epithelial mucus, uh, the epithelial cells that form the mucous membranes. But eventually they can get inside the cell and use actin-based motility to spread around the cell and invade neighboring cells. And this is a movie showing you actin-based motility, time-lapsed uh, photography. This is the, an epithelial cell here. These are the Shigella. Now Shigella don't have flagella. So the movement you see within the cell is actin polymerizing and pushing the Shigella around the cell and eventually from one cell into, an adjacent, into adjacent cells. And so at the end, it looks like kind of a comet tail and that's where the actin's being polymerized. Uh, this is sped up, of course, through time lapse faster than it would normally occur. So there you see the Shigella being pushed around in the cell and you see some of them leaving one cell and invading another cell. Listeria is another bacterium that can do this. Listeria also causes typically foodborne infections. And again, you can see the uh, bacillus-shaped listeria here, and you're gonna be able to see them nicely going from one epithelial cell to another. So there you see one, there you see some that are passing from one cell into another cell. And they're being pushed through the cell through these little comet-like tails, which is actually polymerization of actin, pushing the cell, the, the organism around in the cell. Now Salmonella is another bacterium that uses type three secretion systems uh, to inject intestinal epithelial cells with effector proteins. And in this case, they can stimulate the actin rearrangement causing the epithelial cell cytoplasm to ruffle up and engulf the bacteria. And then the Salmonella can pass through the epithelial cells where they're engulfed by phagocytic macrophages. But again, as we saw earlier, they can then use a type three secretion system uh, to inject molecules from the phagosome in which they're found into the cytoplasm. And these proteins prevent the lysosome of the macrophage from fusing with the phagosome. So the bacteria aren't killed and they can survive and multiply inside the macrophages. And we have a little movie we showed you back in unit one of that, but let's look at that again. 
So first the bacteria use the type three secretion system to trick the epithelial cell, the mucous membranes and the colon into engulfing them. Then it uses the type three secretion system to inject proteins that prevent lysosomes from fusing with the phagosomes. And that provides a safe haven for salmonella replication within the phagosome, protecting the bacteria from antibodies and other defense molecules. And eventually, um, it, the salmonella is able to kill the macrophages by inducing apoptosis or programmed cell suicide. So this little uh, animation shows you that process. So there's a salmonella with its paratrichus flagella swimming through the mucus. There's the microvilli on the surface of the epithelial cells. And once it uh, cause, causes the microvilli to disappear, pili evolve, uh, attach to uh, pilus receptor molecules for the adhesive tip, allowing the bacterium to adhere to the surface. Now it uses a type three secretion system to produce a hollow protein tube and it sends a molecule called a translocan down that actually forms a little donut-like structure that forms a receptor for the needle of the injectosome or type three secretion system and allowing it to anchor itself. Now we're looking inside the cell as it injects effector molecules into the cytoplasm of the intestinal cell of the mucous membranes. And these molecules cause actin to polymerize. I'm going to speed it up just here a little bit because it takes a long time to get that started. So it keeps as more and more actin molecules are added, kind of like a little uh, pop bead chain. The actin filaments get longer and longer. And as they get longer, they push up against the inner surface of the cytoplasmic membrane of our cell. This is the inner surface, pushing the membrane up, producing pseudopodes that engulf the salmonella and place it in a phagosome. Now, once inside the phagosome, the salmonella is going to use the type three secretion system to inject molecules into the cytoplasm of the cell, injecting them through the phagosome into the cytoplasm. And these molecules prevent the lysosome from fusing with the phagosome, so the bacteria aren't killed, but rather they're able to replicate within that cell. And that happens when they get into macrophages too, where they can replicate inside the macrophages and eventually kill the macrophages through apoptosis. Also, molecules injected into the intestinal epithelial cells can sometimes stimulate diarrhea, and that can provide a number of advantages to the bacteria. It can flush out normal microbiota bacteria, so there's less competition uh, for nutrients, and that can also better enable the salmonella that are not attached to host cells to be transmitted to new hosts by the fecal oral route. And again, as we mentioned, with a liquid stool, uh, it's much easier for bacteria to be transmitted from person to person, getting uh, the materials on the hands into the mouth and transmitting it by the fecal oral route. Uh, as we mentioned, another bacteria that has an actin-based motility is Listeria monocytogenes, and that can also use invasins uh, to invade cells and spread to adjacent cells by actin-based motility. And we showed you that movie up above a little bit earlier where we see the Listeria moving in the cell and pushing into adjacent cells. And there's a few other bacteria too that are able to invade epithelial cells. Entro-invasive E. coli, one of the diarrhea-causing E. coli, uh, abbreviated E-I-E-C for entro-invasive E. coli. Legionella pneumophilus that causes Legionnaire's disease can invade host cells and macrophages to have a safe haven for replication. Uh, the F protein and M protein of Streptococcus pyogenes, the group A beta strep that cause strep throat. 
not only allow the bacteria to adhere to cells, but they enable bacteria to invade epithelial cells. And that's thought to sometimes maintain a persistent streptococcal infection and allow the strep to spread deeper in tissue. Uh, the spirochete Borrelia burgdorferi that causes Lyme disease uh, uses a combination of invasins and its motility. Remember, this is a spirochete to penetrate host cells. So it produces an adhesin that adheres uh, to things like endothelial cells in the blood vessels. And then it secretes an invasin, uh, which is really consists of digestive enzymes that enable the spirochete to soften up the cell membrane of the endothelial cells, and with its corkscrewing motility, it's then able to penetrate the whole cell membrane. And it can remain dormant inside of cells for years this way and invade the host immune system when it's in epithelial cells. And of course, you can use this method to uh, penetrate or uh, pass between endothelial cells and enter the lymphatics or the blood and spread to other parts of the body. Likewise, the spirochete trepanema pallidum that causes syphilis works in a similar manner. This is able to adhere to cells, uh, produce invasins that allow it to soften up the membrane and use its drilling corkscrewing motility to invade cells and possibly enter blood vessels and then spread to other parts of the body. So again, we showed you previously this electron micrograph of trepanema pallidum invading cells. And want to back up on that. I think we'll have to right click that one. And I got the same problem there. We have to reload it now, change the magnification. Some of these links, unfortunately, in soft chalk wind up changing the magnification or the resolution of the screen. Sorry about that. So anyway, uh, we, we saw that earlier and we also saw this animation where the, back, the spirochete is using adhesins to adhere to the cell surface and basins to soften it up and its corkscrewing motility to enter, be transmitted by the blood to other sites and then using the same mechanism, leave the blood vessels and set up a new infection at another body site. And there's our highlighted bacterium Borrelia burgdorferi. So as we see, a few bacteria can invade host cells. By invading the host cell, they get a free source of food because our cells are bringing the nutrients in with their transport systems. Body defense molecules can't reach it well once it's inside the cell. Some bacteria can invade phagocytes like macrophages and then using a type three secretion system can prevent lysosomes from fusing with phagosomes so they have a safe haven for growth within the phagocyte. And some um, of the bacteria when they invade dendritic cells can kill those dendritic cells so they can't play their role in inducing adaptive immunity. They prevent them from activating T lymphocytes. And there's our uh, little self quiz at the end you can do. So that's the role of the ability to invade host cells that enables some bacteria uh, to better colonize the host.